So good afternoon, folks. Um, my name's Ken, and we're going to talk about um, security testing for a while. Um, and and I, I, I want to come at this discussion from a couple of different angles. Um, I've done security testing um, for many, many years on all sorts of different types of systems. Uh, I started my um, security testing as a penetration tester years ago. Um, and I very quickly got disillusioned by that. And I find that um, even today, a lot of companies really focus on either just a penetration test or not a whole lot more than that. So um, I want to just kind of describe a little bit of where I come from and why I think that that approach is largely flawed and that we need to do better. I did, as I said, penetration testing for many years. Um, I started doing penetration testing in the early 1990s. Uh, when I worked at the U.S. Department of Defense. And, uh, and, and so I want to tell you about a scenario and, and, and then take it forward. Um, I, I used to work in, a, um, uh, in an operations center right down the hall from um, my, my agency director, a three-star general. And, and he had this interesting habit. Um, it was a very stressful environment, but he would uh, invite in his various different VIP friends um, we had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the Secretary of Defense, all these different VIPs. Uh, he would invite these folks in for a briefing on what, what was going on. And he would give us maybe eight hours of warning and say, okay, the, the general of such and such is coming this afternoon. I want you to break into his site and then we'll show him what we found when he gets here. All right, so we did a lot of that. And, and, and there's, there's value to that, without a doubt. And it was a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. It was an amazing place to work. Um, but th there's also a lot of badness to be learned from there, from the standpoint of developing software and thinking about security testing of software. It's almost the worst possible way to do testing. Um, so when I left the Department of Defense, we went into the, um, a, a couple of us went together into the commercial sector, um, and we started doing penetration testing stuff commercially. And we thought, this is great. We can uh, you know, basically do this stuff that we were doing at the Department of Defense and make a lot of money doing this. And, and I, I quickly just got very disillusioned there. Um, and this is the sort of scenario that we would run into. We would get phone calls saying, hey, I hear you guys do penetration testing. And I, we'd say, yeah, yeah, we, we do that. And they'd say, all right, well, um, we have this application, this web application, and we want you guys to test. Great, we can do that. Um, and we'd have this discussion. And, and I'd hear things like what you see up here. We're, we're just about to go live. All right, so that, that is invariably in this scenario. Um, in a month from now, this application is going into production, and we need somebody to take a look at it. But it was never for the purpose, by the way, of, of testing the security. It wasn't part of the development process. It was almost always this guy right here, right? So, our, our clients would call and say, we want you to do this test uh, because our security team or our auditors require someone to do a penetration test first. And, and so that's kind of my first warning sign. I'm like, oh, this isn't good. This isn't going to work out well. But you know, they want us to do it. They're willing to pay for it. Uh, but it's for all the wrong reasons, right? So, um, and then I'd always hear these words in the conversation. We, we want to see, uh, basically, what can a hacker do? And, and that just makes me cringe. But, but nonetheless, we'd, we'd go in and we would do these things. Um, and so at the, the end of that, I, and, and in the discussions, I, I would always tell them, you know, we're not going to measure how secure you are in doing this. Right? The, the, in a best case scenario, I can tell you how not secure you are. Right? And there's a huge logic gap between saying that you're not secure and saying that as a result of these tests, we believe you are secure. We're not testing if you're secure. We're testing if you're not secure. Um, as, as my colleague um, Gary McGraw likes to say, it's a badnessometer, right? So we can tell you how bad it is based on our tests. But if we fail to get in, and by the way, it's never happened, but if we were to fail to get in, we can't say now you're secure. All we can say is these tests failed to get into your system. Um, and so it, it was a very um, depressing time in many ways because this dialogue repeated itself over and over again. And even though it was lucrative, it was frustrating. <clears throat> so the problems that I see um, in the way people do this, um, they'll, they'll try to do penetration testing or something very, very late in the production, in the, in the development process. And I find that to be frustrating because we need to be looking deeper, right? 
Um, and and they, they frequently, and this pointer isn't doing very well today, but I frequently see that um, the development organizations, or at least many of the organizations I've worked with, they kind of assume that their quality assurance, their QA testers, are going to find some of these problems. Um, and they typically don't. Now, I don't know. I, in fact, I should ask this question. How many of you folks do software testing, security testing specifically? So not a lot of hands going up. So um, in, in my experience, um, QA testers don't look for security things. There are some things that we can have our QA test team do very effectively, but that's not their primary job. In fact, um, I remember vividly, I was out on the West Coast, about, I'm going to say probably about three years ago, and I was doing a, uh, some training for a uh, software company out there. Um, I won't name them, it doesn't matter, but I, I remember after my one class, and it was on web application security, so we were going into things like WebGoat and breaking stuff, right? After the class, one of the guys in the, in the class came up to me and said, hey, I, I'm in the QA team over here, and this was all really interesting, in, uh, eye-opening stuff, but in, in my experience, I've found that if I do the sorts of stuff that you're talking about, basically looking for non-functional attributes of the software, seeing if something behaves in a way that wasn't specified. Um, if I do that, I'll get fired. And I said, well, I, I certainly don't want you to get fired, uh, but tell me why that's the case. Bec and he said, well, because in, in his QA test team, they're doing functional testing, right? So they take a functional specification, they come up with a bunch of test scenarios that are, that are gonna validate or invalidate that functionality, um, and at the end they say it works or it doesn't work. Um, but they can't test for non-functional things. So for example, SQL injection. There's no software other than maybe educational software that has a, a specification saying, if you enter or one equals one, I want you to give up the, 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 the contents of the, the credit card database. That's just not the way we, we do specifications, of course. And I, obviously, I'm being facetious. But um, so th this guy told me that if he tried to do these sorts of things, he would get fired. So clearly, that's not a useful outcome. Um, but this is the sort of thing that I find a lot. Um, organizations, when I, when I ask, um, especially I do a lot of um, on-site work with my clients, and I ask them, what kind of security testing are you guys doing? Um, more often than not, the answer that I hear is pretty vacuous. We're, we're either not doing security testing or we're just doing penetration testing. We have an IT security team um, that's going to do some testing of our software just before we go live. And, and, and th that, I find that to be really um, not, not so fulfilling. All right. <clears throat> My slide changer is not happy with the Wi-Fi here, so let's do it the old-fashioned way. So when it comes to security testing of software, I really think that um, we have to look at things differently. So penetration testing, for example, is inherently a, um, a black box sort of a process. We're on the outside seeing if we can get in. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, I, I've seen penetration testing where the, the test team uh, will be uh, exposed to a lot of information about the application, but, but still it, it is inherently an outside-in sort of thing. When we're doing security testing, we have to go far beyond just outside and can we get in. Um, for one thing, we, we, we have to try to test a lot of different aspects of our software. We have to try to deceive the software in, in ways that the designer or the implementer hadn't quite anticipated. You know? So we look at functional specifications and, and we see what we can do with those. We look at implementation bugs like cross-site scripting, failure to properly validate input and output. We look for things like SQL injection where a SQL call isn't being parameterized and there's a dynamic string because 100% of the SQL injection problems in the world, and this is the number one on OWASP's top 10 for what that's worth. You can read whatever value into that you want, but the, the, the number one on the OWASP top 10 list is injection flaws, SQL injection. Um, and 100% and of those are caused by non-parameterized SQL queries. Uh, it, yes, non-parameterized, where we have a dynamic uh, string query. So <clears throat> we have to try to think differently when we do testing. Um, and that led me down this path. Actually, about, I'm going to say about four years ago probably now, a client of mine asked me to, to put together for them a short um, module on, uh, on security testing. So I spent a lot of time diving into this and and, and, and see what, what, what we can talk about that's meaningful to software developers. 
Um, so <clears throat> there's a couple of different approaches that we can take. Um, uninformed testing, which is frequently referred to as black box testing. Um, and by the way, these are not binary states. This is more of a continuum, right? So we, we can have different levels of either of these. But uninformed um, testing, basically in, in this circumstance, it's kind of like pen testing falls into this. Um, you don't tell your test team uh, much or anything about the target. Um, when I used to do penetration testing at the Department of Defense and in the commercial sector, um, typically all we were told about a target was here's an IP number or a URL that you can access the application, and that's it. And when we would ask questions, so like, can you tell me anything about the technology that's in there? Is it a, a Java application? Is it on WebSphere? Is it whatever? Um, and th they would usually push back and say, no, actually, we don't want to tell you any of that. We want you to discover it for yourself. Um, and I personally think that that mentality is myopic and not very helpful. Uh, but still, that, that's basically the essence of this sort of um, uninformed or black box testing. Um, and an interesting thing from a testing standpoint, um, in traditional QA testing of software, how many of you have heard the term coverage used? Right, so we talk about coverage in our test cases, and, and that can measure a bunch of things, but, but we'll talk about coverage of code, right? So in, in developing our test scenarios, um, especially in a QA context, we're going to try to shoot for maximizing our coverage so that we're exercising, in, in, in an ideal world, we're exercising every single line of code in doing our testing, right? So, but pen testing, um, and, and black box testing in particular, on a really good day, they're up to maybe 20 to 25% code coverage in the tests that they do. And this is based on measured um, numbers, right? So it's pretty abysmal uh, from that standpoint. Uh, and we want to try to drive that higher. Now, now I, I also appreciate that if they're testing the right 25%, the stuff that, that's consumer facing in the, in the case of, say, a web app, uh, they, they might still have the right number on coverage. But even still, if you're just looking at it, from a coverage standpoint, it's pretty uh, terrible. Um, and then we have informed testing. With informed um, testing, you, you, you let your test team really understand the code. So the, the testing that I've done in this realm um, that, that has worked the best uh, uh, occurred when we can sit down with the design team and talk to them about the, the application. Talk to me about the technologies. Tell me how it works. Give me a, a, a diagram of what the application looks like, right? So I need to understand what's going on behind that presentation layer in order to be able to meaningfully um, do, come up with reasonable tests. So um, in this case, and it's not just about trying to emulate an insider, it's really deeply understanding the technologies that are in use. Um, and not just at a network level either, but at an application layer. So I, I, I want to understand, for example, when this component talks to this component, what are they talking? Are they sending SOAP data back and forth, for example, web services? Um, and, and in that case, tell me a little bit about that SOAP interface. How is it authenticated? Um, what kind of uh, encryption are you using to protect the data in transit? What are we doing for mutual authentication of those components? Those are the sorts of questions that I like to think about um, when we're doing informed testing. Um, and from that, we can come up with, with some pretty useful sorts of uh, scenarios. So I, I want to paint for you kind of a picture here um, to, to make you th think a little bit more, perhaps, about um, this, this notion. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is kind of silly. You could put in any example that you want. But in, in this um, fictional or fictitious uh, scenario, um, you're an engineering project leader on, on some software. Maybe it's some embedded software on a mobile device or something. And everything's going fine. You're, you've, your product is out there. It's deployed. You're work, working on version 1.1 or something like that. Um, and along the way, um, the, a, a group of um, attackers publishes a paper out on the net. And, and this really did happen, by the way. This part of this scenario um, actually took place in 1999. There's a group uh, based out of Germany called the Chaos Computer Club. How many of you are familiar with the Chaos Computer Club? Right, so a couple of you, it rings a bell. They published a paper in 1999 um, that spotlighted for the first time to the world this thing called format string vulnerabilities in C. And so they published this paper on a Friday afternoon. Um, I've done incident response operations for many years. And rule number one of 
every single major incident, it begins on Friday afternoon. Uh, I don't know why, but they, they never start on a Monday morning. And it's always that Friday afternoon that you have weekend plans. So that's just kind of a corollary, but if you're going to get involved in operations, understand that your weekends, you've given them up. Um, anyway, so they publish this paper on a Friday afternoon, and your boss reads it. And, and the boss sends you an email and says, oh my gosh, this looks like a big deal. Are we safe? Now, you, you, it's, it's 4.45 on Friday. You want to get out the door. You've got a train to catch to get home or whatever. And you quickly go and run a grep through your source tree. And you find one line of code that has a format string in there, a printf. Um, and, and reading the, the paper uh, that, that the, these guys published, um, you realize that that format string um, is, is weak. Um, anybody tell me what's wrong with, with that? What can you do with, with that line of code? Assuming that this if triggers, by the way, and we'll get to that, what can you do with that line of code? Just one line of C code can lead to complete, really badness happening on your system. Not what size it is, you're close, but the format string problems, um, if, if, let, let me put it differently, if you were properly using printf, what are we missing? How many of you have done C programming, right? So this might be ancient history for a lot of us, but in a format string, uh, the purpose of a formatted string is to be able to specify what the output should look like, to make it be able to line up in pretty columns on the printer and things like that. What's missing here is the description of what format to use, right? So normally there would be two parameters here, a, a double quote and maybe a percent %s or something in there to say, hey, this is a string, and, and you can even give it a specific size. You know? So, so you, could, you could say, I want this string to take up 20 characters so it lines up nicely, as I said, in columns on the printouts. Um, so I mean, it's an old feature, but, but that's how people used to do this stuff in C. But the fact that we're missing the format string, um, there's a vulnerability in there, and, and it's easily exploited. For one thing, we can trivially get that program to crash. Go try it yourself on a Unix machine, Linux machine with a C compiler. Put that line of code without the if statement, just one line of code in your main block, and give it as input a percent %x. You're going to get a segmentation fault, boom, your, your program is going to crash. Because what happens internally, when this thing runs, um, it doesn't care if this format string comes from the first parameter or from the user supplied data. It's going to interpret that, and it's going to try to pop a value off of the stack, and that value doesn't exist. And all of a sudden, you're going to get a seg fault, and your program is going to crash and burn. Um, so, but that's, that's just the functionality loss, right? So the program crashes in, un, under that circumstance. But as the Chaos Computer Club published back then, not only can you get a program to crash, but if we provide an input string, so this is coming presumably from user land, right? If we provide an input string that's carefully constructed, um, we can actually specify a format and have it put data onto the stack, um, or the heap potentially, but we can have it put data onto the stack and then overwrite the instruction pointer so that when this thing returns out of printf, a control flow goes to our little piece of hexadecimal machine code that we put into the stack, and we can get it to execute arbitrary code that we provide. That's called game over, right? So anytime you have a remote exploit where we can put arbitrary code onto a machine and get it to run it on our behalf, like say JavaScript, for example, um, it's pretty much game over from a security standpoint. Um, so we've got a serious, serious problem here. However, again, it, now it's Friday afternoon. It's 4.59. You're getting ready to catch your train. Um, there's this little nagging if statement here. Well, my gosh, what is that? When does that? give me a true, because obviously if that's false, this thing never runs. And if this is the only instance of a vulnerable line of code, if that's always false, I don't care about it, right? And probably more importantly, from a pragmatic from a, um, standpoint, um, if we have to fix this, we have to push out a patch to our customers. A, it's Friday afternoon. They get grumpy when we do that. B, it's expensive to push out a patch. right? If this is like embedded software, you know, I'm kind of picking on mobile devices. But maybe it's not a, a mobile device per se, but maybe it's some embedded software. It might be enormously costly to push out a patch. And if I say to the boss, well, yeah, we've got this printf in there. Let's fix it. 
right? That's the easy approach to take because we, we can say, you know, we're in a text editor, we're developing our software, just fix the code and recompile and we're done with it. But if it's in production, it's deployed, it becomes a very, very difficult situation. And that's where we have to test. Um, we have to be able to have enough confidence in our answer uh, to be able to say to the boss, it's, it's not a problem in our case. We can fix it in the next release, because clearly that's some sloppy code. Um, or it is a problem, and we need to fix it. And even if we say it is a problem, we probably want to have our arms around that problem well enough to really understand the nature, not just of there's a vulnerable line of code, but it, what else do I want to know? If there's a line of code that's vulnerable in my source tree, what else really matters to me? Sorry? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Right, right, I exploitability, how do I get to it? Right, so let, let's, let's take this little scenario further. And, and it's very fictitious, it's, it does, doesn't matter at all. But so we're talking some embedded software. And through some testing, um, just looking at where that line of code is, we determine, oops, um, we determine that the line of code that we're talking about here um, is in the contacts database. And now I'm picking up on Objective-C, right? But this same problem actually exists in, in Objective-C. It doesn't look quite the same, but it's inherited from C into Objective-C. We have a format string problem in Objective-C that works essentially the same. At the very least, we can get a program to crash um, and, and behave really badly. But so <clears throat> we determine that that line of code is in my contacts database. And, and we take it a little bit further with our testing, our, our static analysis of this problem, and we determine that um, the, the line of code executes when I'm entering a new address, a new contact, and I'm putting their street address in. If I put in the street address, we execute this line of code. So to, even just to get to that point in the analysis, we've done some studying, right? We've looked at the source code. We, we've figured out where this thing is, we've run it, and, and we've done some, maybe set a breakpoint just before that and see what it takes to get there if, if, we're, if we didn't know that code intimately. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you the, the manager question. The boss says, are we okay? So, what do you think? Do we patch it? Do we spend the money to patch it? Or do we wait until the next release? What's the attack vector? Right, so if, if the, the vulnerable line of code exists in the contacts database, what matters to us is how can somebody take that knowledge and use it against us? What can they do with it, for starters, and how can they attack us? That's what we want to drive with our testing. So how can they attack us with that knowledge? We, we know that it's in the contacts database. We know that if you're entering a street address, we can get this thing at least to crash and possibly behave worse in, in other ways, like arbitrary uh, code execution. How does a contact get in here? Well, I can go into the contacts database and I can enter a, the plus button and go into new contact like what I've done here. Is there any other way that you can put a contact onto a smartphone? Sorry? Sending a, a V card, right. So how can a V card get into this device? Email, any other channels? Bluetooth, perhaps, sure, sure, that, that's one. NFC? Sorry? NFC, NFC well, I'm, I'm picking on Apple here, so we don't have NFC yet. We, they keep rumoring that it's going to happen, but it never happens. So, but, but in theory, maybe it's an Android device. We have NFC also, sure. What else? SIM card, yeah, you, can, you know, they can still read address books off of SIM cards. I don't know if anybody still uses that uh, mechanism, but you can get an address into there through a SIM card. From, yeah, so if we sync with a PC, we can do that. Yeah, these are great channels, and every one of these is valid. Apps? apps? Yeah, applications can enter data. So, you know, we trust all of our applications because we got them from the Apple App Store. We're not jail jailbroken or anything. So um, all of our apps are, are trustworthy, right? Because I'm sure Apple checks to see if there's a percent X in any of the address book entries that go into it. No, no? you don't think that they would check that? Of course they wouldn't. But we've got now like 10 different ways that we can get data into there, right? We need to test every single one of those. Um, iMessage or MMS or SMS, the, every possible way of getting data into there is a way of getting that line of code to execute. 
And before I go to the boss and say, we need to fix this, or we're good to go, I want to be able to be really confident about my answer, because if I miss one, now I, I'm not quite sure how this sort of a scenario would play out in the U.S. But, or in, the, in, in Europe, but uh, in the U.S., if, if I, if, if, pretend we were at Apple for a minute, and, and I go to my boss and I say, it's okay, and over the weekend, because I said, it's okay, um, somebody publishes an exploit that, that, that is a worm, basically, that sends MMS and it arrives on your machine, runs some code to send that same contact to somebody else on an iPhone, and then it runs some code and sends us, that contact to somebody else, and it keeps going and going and going, and by Monday morning, we're in the New York Times. Um, that's that's career-ending, right? I, at the very least, it's that job-ending. <laughs> Uh, you're not going to be working in that company by the end of that next day. Um, and, and, and maybe that's a good thing, but, but, but either way, um, it, it's a big issue. And, and not just me, because who cares about me, but the company now. Because I have a fiduciary responsibility to protect my employer. Um, I've just exposed them to a massive, massive problem if I didn't do my job testing right. More to the point, you'll never learn any of this by doing penetration testing. This is not the aim of penetration testing. It's not something you would ever look for. And I know that I've, uh, I've given you a scenario that you're not likely to hit. But even still, the, the, to me, this is not a very unrealistic sort of set of um, hypotheticals. So let's move forward. <clears throat> um, how do we do testing? Um, if we know, and, and I'm going to keep coming back to that example, right? So we've got this contacts database. Um, we want to go and, and push this thing and try to figure out if, if our answer to the boss needs to be yes or no. So there's a couple of different types of testing that we can do. Um, and I'm going to step through these a little bit. Um, how many of you have heard of fuzzing? I know that word has been used quite a few times here this week already. Most of you, I hope, have at least heard this term in testing. But let me explain what it is. Uh, when we do fuzz testing of software, we basically take our software and bombard it with garbage. Right? Now, we can choose that garbage, or we can have it completely random, but we're going to bombard our software with some garbage data. Oh, pardon me, and see if we can find some breakpoints. Um, there's a bunch of different ways we can do this. But most importantly, when we send it stuff, we're going to look for failures. Right? So we're going to look for it to crash. We're going to look for um, it to behave in a non-functional sort of way. <clears throat> There's a couple of different approaches we can take here when we do fuzzing. Um, we can do smart fuzzing and dumb fuzzing, which is kind of sort of like white box or, or informed versus uninformed. But with dumb fuzzing, we take all the interfaces that we can find and just throw garbage. Truly, just in fact, pump a random number generator, add infinitum into the input of our software. Um, smart fuzzing is where it gets interesting. When we, when we want to use a smart fuzzing approach to test something like our little contacts application, um, now we look at the interfaces and we try to learn what type of data you're expecting. Like we talked about sending an, a V card, a virtual card, uh, uh, in, into somebody by email, by MMS, by whatever. Um, with smart fuzzing, we're going to study the V card format. Somebody is going to go out and read the RFC on the format of a V card. And we're going to try all sorts of different combinations and permutations of what's legal or what's allowable in a v-card format. And we're going to throw it at that software and see if we can um, get that code, that, that, um, that printf, in our case, to break. <clears throat> so we, we want to choose the targets that we're going to fuzz. Um, and th this is, by nature, highly informed testing. You cannot do this in an uninformed testing way. The closest you can come to that is with uh, dumb fuzzing. If you know that there's an interface, you can just throw stupid stuff at it and see what happens. But that's almost meaningless. But smart fuzzing is where we really study the interface. Uh, for example, <clears throat> there's a file. In our case, with our contacts database, vCard. As I said, if we're going to smart fuzz that, we're going to go out and read the RFC on what a vCard is all about. What fields are mandatory? What fields are optional? What happens if we put two street addresses in? And if the specification says you're only allowed, say, three street addresses, what happens if we put in four? What happens if we put in 4,000? Right? Construct a V card that just looks insane, that's non-compliant with the RFC, B 
because attackers don't read the RFCs and, and make sure their, their attacks conform with different RFCs. They're going to try to break things. Um, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about with, with smart fuzzing. I want to tell you a story. Um, it's not mine. It, it came from a, a brilliant guy named Hugh Thompson. Um, and, and Hugh was a, a software tester for many, many years. And I saw him present this, and, and I was mesmerized by this story. So I want to tell you his story, and probably not as well as he tells it. Um, so he's on an airplane. And this is probably six, seven years ago. He's on an airplane, um, and they're flying over the ocean. It's a long flight. He's bored to death. And so he's, you know, what am I going to do? You know, eight more hours to go. And he sees that uh, there's this um, the phone in the handrest next to his seat. Um, and I, I think I've been on the same plane. So the, he pulls out the phone, and he looks at it, he's playing with it. And he sees that on one side of the phone, um, it's a phone, it's got the numeric keypad. On the other side, it's a game card, a game controller, like a little Nintendo game. So he's looking at this, and he thought, all right, fine, I'll play, play Tetris for the next 20 minutes or so, right? Because that'll calm me down. Um, so <clears throat> he goes in, and he starts playing Tetris for a while. And after five minutes, he gets bored of playing Tetris. So he goes in, and he starts thinking like a software tester. And, and, and this is where the, the story gets interesting. So he goes into the Tetris. You, you set up the game. And you, what you can do is you can set the, um, I think it's the minimum size of, a, of one of the things that's falling out of the sky. You could set it between one and four. Right, one block up to four blocks. And he goes into there, and he presses the plus button, and it goes beep, 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 beep. It goes up to four, presses the plus button again, and it beeps at him. All right, so we can't go beyond that. So he presses the minus button, it goes down to one, presses it again, and it beeps at him. Ah, I mean, that's kind of silly testing. There's not a whole lot we can do here. So he goes to put the phone back, because he's bored. And as he does that, he sees the numeric keypad. And he thought, huh, I wonder. So before putting the phone away, he picks it up, and he presses the 5 button. And the game beeps at him, just like it would have if he was at 4, and he pressed the plus button. And I thought, all right, well, what happens if I press 6? Sure enough, it went to 6 in the game. He thought, ooh, this is cool, right? So I'm outside of this, the plus minus thing, and I can go to 6. And he presses plus again, or uh, seven, rather. He presses the seven button. He gets a game piece of seven. He presses eight. He presses nine. And then he tries 10. And when he pressed the one, it went back to one. And so it couldn't take a two-digit number. And then he thought, all right, well, that was fun, but we're done here. He's putting the phone back in, and he remembers that there's that plus and minus button back on the Tetris side of things. So he goes to nine, turns it over, presses the plus button. It goes to 10. So now he's thinking, oh my god, this is awesome. Plus, 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 plus. And the game piece is wrapping off the end of his screen. He's getting this Tetris game piece of a 127 pieces long, and then he stopped. Why did he stop at 127? No Sorry? No That's a good guess. It's not the right guess, but it's a good one. What? Computer scientists. Exactly. So if, if it's a... If it's represented in the, in the CPU as a one-byte integer, and it's a, you know, one byte, we should be able to go to 255, right? But what if it's a signed integer? It, should, it can go to 127. What happens if we add 1 to 127, and it's represented as a signed integer? Sorry? Yeah, it becomes negative 128. Really big negative number all of a sudden. And, and it, so. As, as a software guy, he's, he's clicking this, and, and he stopped wisely at 127, and, and he just took stock of where he is at 38,000 feet above the air, <laughs> uh, ground. And, and, and this is, again, this is his story, but he told it really well, and I was blown away by this. So he's at 38,000 feet in the air, and just before he started playing this game, he was looking at a GPS screen, looking at a map. So he knows that at some level, this thing is connected to the navigation system in the plane. Now, not knowing the system very well, you, that we, we assume that connection to be pretty loose and that there's no way to change the nav system. But still, you're testing not just a production system, but a production system that you're sitting in. <laughs> um, and, and it makes you internalize that a little bit more. So he thought, all right, well, what could possibly go wrong? He pressed the plus key one more time, and his screen went black. And he thought, ah, that's not good. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees the guy next to him, his screen went black. <laughs> and he looks down the aisle, and he, in horror, he watched all of the screens on this plane go black. 
and he's sitting there basically in, in impact position. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going to happen next? And sure enough, the machines eventually rebooted, and everybody was grumpy, but they were restored. And he never told anybody that it was his fault. Uh, <laughs> But, so, but the, 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 the lesson here about the software testing side of it, think about that, right? So you've got, <clears throat> you're thinking about how something is, is represented inside the computer. You've got to understand the hardware. You've got to understand what's inside. We know that when you add 1 to 127 for a one byte signed integer, it becomes negative 128, right? And so in terms of a negative number for something representing a real world thing, like the number of game pieces or blocks in a game piece, that shouldn't ever happen, right? So side story to that, um, about six years ago, um, there was an airline, still is, I guess, uh, in the US, a little uh, regional airline called Comair. Um, and on Christmas Eve, some six or so years ago, um, their baggage handling system ground to a screeching halt. And they stranded about 2,000 of their customers in airports all around America on Christmas Eve. Um, and, and if there's any single way to guarantee grumpy customers, it's strand them in the airport. If you want to make matters worse, do it on a big holiday. Right, so um, what happened there? It turned out that up until that evening, their baggage handling system had never experienced more than how many bags? 32,767. You know what happens when you add one to that and it's a signed integer? Right, same problem with 127, except now we're talking a couple more bytes. Um, and why on earth would a software developer use a signed integer for something like the number of bags that we're tracking? Sorry? It's standard, who knows? Maybe they're using a library, maybe they're using somebody else's tool. But a signed integer for tracking the number of bags in a system, that, that says it, it can never be negative. Right, so you would never use a signed integer for that, but Comair did. And at the next board meeting, their CEO got fired. Um, and it was a major public relations disaster for them. But I, I love the story, and it really makes you understand um, the, the, the testing side of it. And, and these are things, as I said, th this is not something you ever find in a penetration test. Yes? If you use an unsigned integer, you just move the problem uh, to 64 times. You're right. You're, so, but, but, but perhaps. It'll be the next CEO's problem to worry about. But even still, so if, if we used, uh, it, we, clearly the, the, the math there should have been done a lot better than just add one to it and hope for the best. Um, if we used a signed integer and make it a long signed integer maybe, now the problem is in the many millions. And, and now it's a, a, a less likely problem to, to uh, actually result in an issue. And, and why they're doing that in C, presumably, is another issue. But, but still, you're, you're right. It, it, if we just make the problem bigger, it doesn't mean that the problem went away. We should be, have been doing bounds checking on that prior to allowing that um, instruction. <clears throat> All right, so um, other types of fuzzing. Network interface fuzzing. Um, web applications are beautiful for this in many cases. right? So we have the standard HTTP interface to a web application, the get method, the post method. There's it, it, even the, the simplest of web applications, go look at WebGoat from OWASP. If you look at a, a, an individual um, servlet in WebGoat, there's probably a couple dozen things on any given HTTP post that's fuzzable, right? reasonably fuzzable. Things like user agent even. right? So it doesn't have to be programmatically part of our application. It can be something that the operating system or the browser is putting in. And yet, it can cause the, the back-end system to choke. Uh, most software these days, web applications, they'll check to see what user agent you're using and, and adjust the presentation layer accordingly. I know that on my iPhone, when I connect to a site, I frequently get shunted off to like the mobile version of that site. And now they're using um, HTML and, and, and such that's relevant to a small browser like that. Um, so they're, they're looking at things like user agent. So let's give them some numbers that don't exist. See what, see what the back-end software does with it. Give them numbers like 32,768 and whatnot. Um, those are perfectly reasonable things to fuzz. Um, <clears throat> all the way on down to network layer stuff itself. I did a, um, uh, some fuzz testing for a client of mine about ooh, three years ago now. Um, they had an XML interface 
um, basically, a, think of it as a SOAP interface, web services between themselves and one of their business partners. And um, when my, my, actually an old friend of mine, a, uh, this client, showed me this interface and we talked about it, um, I, I won't go into all the details. Um, they're actually not that far from here in any case, but um, I, I, I hypothesized that you know, that interface, if they're not in doing proper validation on it, it might be well be possible to get a SQL injection problem through that interface, for example, or perhaps uh, even a cross-site scripting or some other type of poisonous data into that interface. And, and so he went, and he's an IT security guy, not at all a software guy, and he took this to his developers and said, Ken said that there's a problem, and yada, yada, and they all came back to him and said, no, 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 don't worry about a thing. The, the, the XML interface has a schema, and the input has to uh, adapt or has to conform with that schema. And for every element in that um, XML interface, that we, we're providing a regular expression that, that um, explicitly says what you're allowed to put in there. I said, well, that sounds pretty good, but can you show me the schema? He said, sure, send it to me. And I looked at it. And, and sure enough, there were about five or six fields in there that were very loosely defined, just like 1,024 characters, uppercase, lowercase, anything you want. So I said, well, I still think that we, we shouldn't let it go entirely. I think it's probably worth taking a closer look at. So he went back to the developers, and they came back and said, well, we don't really know. So my friend said, all right, let's test this. And so we set up some testing. Um, I had to generate some XML files, basically. So this is more file fuzzing than network interface fuzzing. But that was mainly because I wasn't allowed to touch a production system. I'm just a consultant to them, after all, which is perfectly reasonable. Uh, but what I did was I took their XML interface with this schema, and I started with an, an input file that perfectly conformed to their schema. And then I took every element that I knew that I could manipulate loosely based on what the schema said, um, and I took a dictionary of attacks. I went out uh, to the net, and I found dictionaries of SQL injection attacks, for example. And then I, I wrote a script. Um, you'll probably cringe, but I wrote this in GNU Emacs Lisp because I'm familiar with that. It was an easy tool to do it. So I wrote this script that would go out and take each of these attacks from the dictionary, plug it into each of these fields one at a time, and then step through every single possible combination and permutation. And so we ended up with somewhere in the neighborhood of, say, 10,000 different inputs into this thing. And I bundled them all up into a zip file, threw them over the fence to my friend, and said, here's some test inputs for you. So they ran them. And uh, they found that, that uh, the vast majority of these SQL injection attacks were, at the very least, getting through the front end. Um, and now they weren't misbehaving at the back end. They, they didn't result in SQL injection, but they did get through the filtering at the front end. So it's a problem, but it's not a directly exploitable problem. Nonetheless, they, they, they drastically changed how they were doing this. And that came entirely out of fuzz testing. Um, you would never have found that through things like penetration testing. Um, <clears throat> other things to fuzz, any API, any I.O., it basically is a potential fuzz target. So um, a, 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 an API, um, registry keys in, on a Windows system, uh, desktop or server, we can fuzz any data, after all. So I've found some fairly lucrative fuzz targets in environment variables, right? So, but then you think about, and go back to our scenario with our phone and the contacts database. Um, say I can go in and I can change something in an environment variable on a Unix server and on a process and have this application choke and, and do misbehave, right? So now what's, what are the preconditions of that attack? How do, how do I construct that attack? It means I have to have some level of access on that server already to be able to change that, that input. So it's, it's not a, a viable attack vector but it's still an issue. And I've found a lot of times applications blindly read what's in an environment variable because we trust those things. <clears throat> All right, so how do we do these tests? Um, fuzzing, uh, by its nature, is not something you ever, ever want to do manually. I've observed what, what amounts to manual fuzzing many times over the years, but just trust me when I say that this isn't the best way to do it. It's laborious, it's time consuming, it's not the way to do it. So we want tools that are going to do fuzzing. Um, the problem is, though, that unlike, say, with penetration testing, 
there's no tool that does everything that we want, right? So there's tons of penetration testing tools out there. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Um, but for fuzzing, we don't really have general purpose tools. We have a couple of specific purpose tools, like OWASP has a little tool called JBro Fuzz. JBro Fuzz is great for um, fuzzing a single HTML document, or HTTP interface, rather. So if you took your web application and used a tool like uh, Burp Suite, a, a web application proxy tool, intercepted one of the post requests into your application, plugged that into JBro Fuzz, now you can go through that request and highlight the fields or the areas of this thing that you want to fuzz, like the user agent, all the way on down to the parameters going in the post itself, um, going off to the server. Anything in there is fuzzable. Um, and JBro Fuzz, even though it's pretty simplistic, it's pretty good at fuzzing a single interface like that. The problem is if you wanted to fuzz an entire web application, and it's a complex web application with, say, dozens and dozens of different servlets at the front end, um, you'd, you'd have to construct a series of attacks against all of them. Um, so typically, you're not going to fuzz everything in an application, but you're going to go after the high value targets. Let's say, just very hypothetically again, that we're at Amazon, um, and we want to consider fuzzing some of our assets. Uh, you're not going to do everything, but if you think about the business functionality of Amazon, what do you do? So think about the use cases. Right, so you go in, you, you connect into Amazon. It says, welcome back, Ken. If you're not Ken, then click here. Yours might say something different, but I know it says that every time I go there. Um, and, and then, so I, I, I do some browsing around. I put some things into a shopping cart, and then I go to purchase them. I, I check out, right? Um, in the checkout process, I have to specify payment information. Um, and included in the, in the checkout process, I, I specify how to pay, but also where to ship the product to. So those are the highest value to me. When I think of that user story, I think of um, the, the payment information, but that's coming from the user. Um, and it's not owned, if you will, by, by Amazon. But shipping address, I worry about. What, what sort of stuff can we put into there that, that could cause disruption? So we, we take the highest of value um, assets in an application, and we consider fuzzing those first. Uh, probably, as I said, not everything, but we try to fuzz those first. Because what could go wrong, right? So if I can find a way um, to get um, a, a, a fuzz test to do something nasty in that Amazon interface to, for, for the shipping address, um, maybe I can find, say, for example, a, a SQL injection attack in there that allows me to alter somebody else's shipping address. That would be a bad scenario, right? So we think about targets like that um, in terms of outcomes and scenarios. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Um, pen testing. Um, as I said at the beginning here, I'm hugely not a fan of pen testing. Um, and, and certainly, pen testing can't be your only form of security testing. If you're only doing penetration testing, you're making a mistake. However, um, that's not to say that you shouldn't do it. Um, you absolutely should do penetration testing but it should be one small piece of your security testing. Um, and if you're going to do it, I have a couple of tips that you want to think about in order to get some value out of penetration testing. Um, for starters, um, trying to do an, a completely uninformed test, even if it's a penetration test, in my view, is wasted money. Y your money is better spent on something that you enjoy. Right? So take your team on, on, out to an amusement park or something, or out to dinner, spend the money on that but don't spend it on uninformed penetration testing. There's not much value there, in my, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> however, there's some things that, that it's useful for. So what I specifically like are things that, like nightmare scenarios that we consider. Right? So Amazon. If I can find a way to get into my account on Amazon and change somebody else's shipping address, that's kind of like game over for Amazon. If I can change somebody else's shipping address so that every time they purchase something, it comes to me, and they have no indication of that, Amazon has a serious, serious problem. So we think about that's, that's the nightmare scenario that keeps the CIO or the CSO up at night. Well, from that scenario, let's see what it would take to do that. And we study the system. We figure out where those databases are and what are their interfaces to them. And we try to come up with some scenarios around that, um, more than just have at it, right? So a typical penetration test from a, 
outside in standpoint um, uh, is, is just kind of shooting around in the dark and it's not too useful. Um, the a network testing uh, penetration test goes through a fairly methodical process, um, but again, you're, you're not targeted. You're just, what it is useful for though, in doing this sort of approach, you know, scan the network, see what targets we have, look to see if any of them have any known vulnerabilities. If they do have any known vulnerabilities, let's exploit those vulnerabilities, and then let's see what we can do to get farther once we break into one or two of those things. What this process is useful for is testing our deployment environment, right? So let's say we have a web application and we want to put it on a, on a consumer facing network segment. We've got a firewall in front of it, no doubt, and all those sorts of things, but we want to test the, the, the um, operational environment where we're going to place our software. This sort of penetration testing has value. You want to do it periodically, maybe every month, maybe every night, but it's going to be automated and this is simple sort of stuff. Um, but for example, um, going back a few years, um, I had a client, um, yeah, how many of you remember the Code Red uh, worm, the Microsoft Code Red worm? It's about 1999 or 2000 or so. Um, I had a customer at the time, and, and uh, it's actually the, the Code Red uh, incident makes a fascinating case study because what happened was the vulnerability was announced early in the summer, like say sometime around June. Somebody published it out on one of the full disclosure lists on the internet. Um, and then around, I, I might have the, the days wrong, but somewhere around the middle of July, Microsoft published a patch for that. And then sometime around mid to late August, we had this code red worm that went out there and, and exploited that vulnerability and spread. Um, and the theory, at least in the IT security world, was that uh, the attackers that did this thing took a look at the patch, and what can you do with a, a security patch? You can compare the before and the after. So what they did was they took this patch from Microsoft and basically did some regression on it, took a look at, at what was unpatched versus what's patched, and you can very quickly put a spotlight on where the changes are. And from there, they were able to figure out what the vulnerability was. Then they went and coded this, this worm that would exploit that vulnerability. And this thing went and spread on the internet. Now, back to my customer. Um, when Microsoft put out their patch, and this th it w well, first it was announced, then Microsoft put out a patch, my client called me and said, we've patched all of our systems on this one production segment. And this production network was really important to them. They said, we want you guys to go and test that quickly and just make sure test our deployed environment to make sure we didn't make any mistakes. I said, all right, well, that's easy enough to do. It'll take 10 minutes, you know, real quick and easy. So I said, um, can we uh, hit everything on that network? They said, well, we're going to give you uh, some explicit IP numbers to test for. And I said, okay, fine. They gave me a list of about 10 or 20 um, IP numbers. We tested them. We came back and said, they're all patched. You're good to go. Um, two weeks later, the code red uh, hit, and this company, which is a Fortune 100 company, um, had code red come in through their network, hit their exchange servers inside the corporation, and for 72 hours, this Fortune 100 company was incapable of doing email on the internet, and it made them really, really, really grumpy. Um, so they, they called me and said, Guys, you tested it and you said we were okay. What, what on earth could happen here? So we, we went and took a close look to see what happened. Turns out that um, when they gave us the list of IPs to target, um, they gave us their production systems. But on that same network, they had some test bed systems that weren't under configuration management. So their testing process, and I guess ours, we should have done a, a, a scan to see what, el what else might have been on there, but still, um, the, 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 they, because of a test bed machine connected to a production network, a Fortune 100 company was down for 72 hours. Um, not a happy result. All right, so <clears throat> to that point, um, most penetration testers do penetration testing on behalf of the IT security team, right? And, and they write their report to an audience of IT security people. That's not to say it's good or it's bad, it's, it just is, right? So they write their report for the IT security team. And, and I've seen those reports hundreds of times. What they'll typically look like is, well, we found this problem on one of your Windows systems. We were able to exploit um, that Microsoft vulnerability, uh, yada, yada. Here's a screenshot. Here's how we did it. Um, and, and you need to put in this patch. You need to fix it, right? 
Um, th that's useful for an IT security audience. It's almost useless to a software developer. So let me give you a scenario and, and give you two ways of doing this. So our penetration test runs. We find a SQL injection problem. We, we put together our report. We hand it to the IT security people. The IT security guy takes a look at this, sees a SQL injection attack against a database, spits out a bunch of credit card numbers, really, really bad, um, and, and tears that page out and goes running down the hall to the software engineering lead and says, guys, we've been telling you about SQL injection for 10 years, and here we go and find one on your system. Fix this. So the manager looks at this and goes, well, my gosh, they're right. There is a SQL injection problem there. Runs down the hall to, to Bob, who was doing the coding on this, and says, Bob, fix this. Bob, who has absolutely no idea what a SQL injection problem is, looks at the problem and says, oh, well, the input there was OR1 equals 1 or some such, and puts in his code a thing that says, if the input is OR1 equals 1, don't execute that SQL query. And so they run the test again, and it works. Uh, or they, they were not able to break into the network again, um, and, and everybody's happy, right? But we know that the problem isn't fixed. Same scenario for an audience of software developers, and we found a SQL injection problem in one of your applications. We were able to exploit it, and here's all the credit card numbers we stole out of your database. Um, we, we were able to do this because you're using a mutable SQL API. Uh, we, we suggest that you use an immutable API, such as a parameterized query, prepared statement, stored procedure. Here's some code examples of what that would look like. Um, that is meaningful and useful to a software developer. Now, I know that's a simple, really simple, contrived example, but that's what you need to look for. And so, if, especially if you're trying to outsource having IT uh, security or, or a penetration testing team look at your application, you need to make sure that they know how to speak to an audience of software people, not an audience of IT security. <clears throat> when we do... Um, Penetration testing, there's tons of automation out there. Um, if, if you talk to your testing team, they're almost certainly going to be intimately familiar with these first three and probably a few others. So these first three are, are pretty freely available. They're not all open source, but they're freely available. Um, the, the others there are commercial tools, but uh, the tool space for penetration testing is mature. Uh, we started writing and seeing uh, s penetration testing tools in, I'm going to say, about 1993, 1994, those started appearing. Um, so that market is really mature now. There's tons of tools out there to automate this stuff. Nonetheless, the really interesting stuff doesn't happen through the automated tools. <clears throat> All right, switch gears. Um, another type of testing, dynamic validation. This is one of my favorites. Um, with dynamic validation testing, what we want to try to do is take our security requirements and assumptions and verify that our software is actually behaving like we expect it to. So, for example, if we have a, a, um, a requirement or an assumption that says our tokens must, our session tokens can only be passed in a HTTPS or SSL encrypted context. So we're always protecting session tokens and any cookies and such, we're always protecting those in transit. All right, so there's a reasonable security requirement to have. In our validation testing, we should be watching our application and make sure that that's all that it's doing. And when we look at all of the, the traffic at a network level now, when we look at our application on the network, we should be able to verify that at no point is it uh, passing any session uh, tokens or, or cookies at, at all in a non-protected format. Uh, those are things that are reasonable to test for and pretty easy to test for. That's the sort of thing that I think the QA people can do very effectively as well. Um, so setting, up, setting up a test rig and stepping through every interface of an application and monitoring the network traffic to make sure that everything is SSL encrypted, um, that is not rocket science, and yet it's really useful and meaningful. Um, let me give you another example here. Um, Imagine, if you will, <coughs> a, a loop in an application. <coughs> we have an application that's doing some encryption, right? And it's going through this loop and encrypting a big block of data. Um, and at the beginning of this, it, it creates 
some random key. So it has a, uh, a data encrypting key that is generating uh, from some source of really good randomness. Um, and then it's going through this loop. It's encrypting some data. At the end of that, we're deliberately wiping out the encryption key. We've done our job with the encryption. We're, we finished it. We zero out that, that key so it's not sitting there in process memory. Um, I've seen this. It's an easy mistake. But this is a simple example, but it's an important example. If we went in and looked at our source code, <coughs> Everything looks correct, right? So we do a static code analysis, and we're using whatever tool we use for static code review. And we see that, OK, we're generating a key. We're using a, a suitable and That's not suitable, by the way. But we're using some good source of randomness. Um, we're, we're doing our encryption, and then we're getting rid of the key when we're done with it. All good best practice sort of stuff. We say it's good to go. But in dynamic validation testing, we look at it in a debugger. We single step through this process. And it turns out that that key remains in memory, and we can still find it, even after that line of code should have executed. And we go, wait a minute, what's, what's wrong here? It turns out that, and I've seen this, um, a simple compiler optimization stepped in on our behalf and said, well, you're setting this variable to be this value, but you're never referring to it again for any purpose. So in the interest of speeding up your program a little bit, we ignored that step. Um, the fix to this is pretty simple, but you wouldn't find that from static code analysis. You would only find that by watching the code in action. And how do you do that? You put it into a debugger and you single step through it. Anybody know a shortcut to that? Because I'd love to find out if there is one. It's, but it's, it's laborious, it's time consuming, but when you have something that's as vital as this simple scenario, that's the sort of validation testing that you have to do. Um, you don't have to single step through the entire application, but you've got to know how something critical like that works and verify that it's behaving as you expect it to. Static code review doesn't always do, uh, provide you the right answer. Yes, sir? It's kind of, it's kind of an example of a definition rule error. Yep. You know, from, from, from that data flow, so that would be an example of a definition that you, which is regarded as being a problem, but then to generate the definition rule to graph it isn't automatic. Yep, yep, but, and, and, but it's something that, that if I'm not verifying it through dynamic validation testing, I don't trust the executable to do the right thing. Um, and, and even a source code review, and, and you know, let, let's pretend that this is some really highly important crypto code that we're analyzing. Um, you're not going to be satisfied unless you dive deep into it. And that's the sort of testing that, that's meaningful in that context. <clears throat> All right, so let's move forward. Um, dynamic validation, there's not a whole lot in the way of automation here that's going to help us. Yes, sir? Uh, uh, Certainly. Um, well, y yes and no. Certainly, if, if you're debugging or if you're compiling in your test bed with a debug flag on and you're specifically adding some extra code for, for test purposes, yes. But there's nothing saying that you can't take your production compile or your production build um, configuration and test that code through a single stepping debugger. Because the, the debugger can take any, anything executable, of course and just step through it and, and verify that it's doing what we want it to do. We can, uh, with most debuggers, we can set breakpoints. So set a breakpoint in that loop and, and watch it. Set a breakpoint right after we exit that loop, look at memory contents, and just verify that it's doing the right thing. Uh, but, and it doesn't have to be different code out of necessity or different machine code out of necessity than what goes into production. Well, so there's clearly more code to it than this example. Um, but but uh, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate an, a, a, a principle here. So clearly, there's more to this key than just encrypt something and throw it away, because then we have a bunch of high entropy garbage that nobody can ever touch. Um, but, and it, that's a good point, a very good point. Yep. Uh, but if it's sitting in pr process memory, and that's the exposure that we're worried about, because this device is deployed somewhere, um, that, that, that's something we want to make sure is being properly cleaned up.
Good questions, all of them. Any other questions before I move on? All right, so <clears throat> um, tools for doing this. There's not a lot. There's a couple things that we can do with web applications. Um, I'm a big fan of web application proxy tools, Web Scarab, Zap from OWASP, um, Burp Suite. We can intercept network traffic between our browser or our client works with mobile applications too. Um, between our client side and our server side, we can watch all of the network traffic go back and forth. We can dig lower than that also if we want and use uh, network protocol analyzers like Wireshark and watch the raw network traffic go through. Um, those are all reasonable things to do and things like uh, debuggers with, with various breakpoints to, to zoom in on a key piece of code. <coughs> um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The final category of testing here that I want to talk about is risk-based testing. And this is kind of a catch-all for one thing, but it's also um, the, the real, in, in some ways it sure can be the, the, the most uh, important stuff that we look at. So we take our biggest, worst nightmare scenarios that keep us awake at night, or keep the CIO awake at night, and we try to verify them, right? So. Um, for example, let's say we have a, a payment system that's passing keys around. We want to try to take a scenario where somebody intercepts that key or somebody gets that key off of a, um, a hard drive image that they're able to steal. Uh, and we might come up with a few different attack scenarios um, in our threat modeling process that, of course, we would have gone through at this point. Uh, those attack scenarios um, fall well into this category of risk-based testing. So we want to go through them and, and try them one at a time, make sure that they're valid or not valid. I mean, in, in this type of testing, failure is a good thing. Because if we, if we have this theory, somebody said during our threat model, well, what if somebody makes an image of that hard drive? I bet you they'll be able to get the encryption key. Well, let's find out. And if it turns out that we can't get to the encryption key that way, we're happy about it, so, but we, we need to verify it, right? So I looked at, um, I did some analysis of a, a credit card payment system a couple of years back where exactly that sort of thing came out of the threat modeling, and we, we put together about a dozen or so test scenarios that specifically tried to exercise those demons, those, those worst case scenarios, um, and see what we can find. And here, automation is pretty much not even relevant, right? So. We'll, we'll look at the, we'll do things like forensic analysis of a hard drive image to look for well, for example go back to my encryption um, example let's say that we we're looking at some crypto code and we're really concerned about any form of exposure of our key here actually our key here right we're worried about that key being exposed so we worry about it in process memory for one thing but we might also worry about it what happens if this process gets paged or swapped. It's running on a virtual memory system. If it gets paged off to a disk, that key could potentially be sitting in memory. Now, in C, anyway, we can control that. In Java, to a lesser degree, but, but we can partially control what gets swapped and what doesn't get swapped. But at the end of the day, if that's a really, really high-risk exposure, if somebody makes an image of that drive and is able to get to that key, um, we've got a huge problem on our hands. Um, you need to test it. And, and going through that scenario of load up the machine, do the encryption, load up a bunch of other processes and see if this thing swaps or pages out, the only reliable way of testing for that is actually doing disk level forensic analysis of the page file and the swap files and see that it, it's, it's behaving as we expect. And we can, we can construct a scenario that makes that easy, right? So we could put in our own chosen key, like one, two, three, four, five, and then see if we can get it to swap, and then we search for that known key in, in page file and, and, and um, swap files. There's ways that we can make the testing easier, but there's not good automation of this form of testing. But that's the, the, the highest risk sort of stuff. Um, I have a couple of examples here I want to step through. Um, th these are all the, the identity has been masked, but these were from production web applications. And it's a few years ago now, but the technologies haven't changed much. But I want to step through each of these because there's some really interesting discussions that come out of them. So I'm showing you a front-end um, network level discussion with an authenticator in all four examples, right? 
So in each case, there's going to be some user credentials and maybe or maybe not some session credentials going between the client and the server. Um, and I want to step through each of these and let's talk about them a little bit because this is the sort of stuff that can come out of either dynamic testing or risk-based testing. And there's some really meaningful stuff that's going on in these applications. You would never find it in a code review or a penetration test. But let's start with the first one here. Who, who can kind of qualitative tell me, qualitatively tell me what's good and bad about this one? If somebody just showed you this HTTP post and said, is this a good thing or a bad thing? What's your answer? It's over HTTP. It's over HTTP, so there's no encryption, right? So that's number one. There's no SSL. Right, there's a session token down here. There's a parameter for the username, parameter for password, session token, and it's not encrypted. It's kind of a worst possible case scenario, right? So if, if you were to write a checklist of things that you can do badly on an authenticator, everything up here would be on your list. Everybody agree with me? Pretty bad, right? So let's move on. <clears throat> Second one. HTTPS, we like that. There's no session token this time. There's only a cookie for setting a, a language, and that, we'll ignore that. This one has a referrer header, uh, also coming from an SSL encrypted context from some other page in this application. What does it tell us about the uh, technology that's in, in use? Struts. Yeah, Java struts, uh, it's a pretty old application. As I said, most of these are pretty dated, but I guarantee you these came off of production applications. I just changed all the headers around pretty drastically. So the, the username and password are down here, right? And, and now we're talking a design issue. Do we, do we hash it on the client side and then send it to the authenticator and have it verify that? Um, or do we send it like this in an SSL context and expect the server to do the work? It's a design issue. You can argue both ways. I don't like this. At the end of the day, I think there's better ways of doing it. But if we're talking in a web browser and we're hashing in the browser in some JavaScript or something, is, is that good? We're exposing our hash algorithm to our, uh, potentially to an attacker. Um, not good, but, but still. So that, that's a debatable point, but it's, it's an issue. Yeah, I, th th that actually was just uh, a silly header I grabbed off of something else and, and, and cut and pasted it in there. So we're not going to read much into that. No, no, there's, there's a lot of things that we should be doing better than this on there. And you're right. But, but I don't like, it, 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 you, as I said, we can argue that back and forth. Is it good to expose our, the algorithms on the client or do we leave it to the server? I don't really care, but at the very least, there's, there's one form of attack specifically that I'm looking for uh, here to see if it's vulnerable, the coffee shop attack, as I call it. So if somebody was running a network sniffer and you were logging in on this Wi-Fi that we're on right now, and I'm sitting over here, I'm running Wireshark, and you're connected on your laptop or your mobile device into this application and it sends this post, um, that coffee shop attack Everything that you see up here is protected. Everybody agree with me? So a, a simple eavesdropping attack, no man in the middle or anything, just simple eavesdropping attack, we're protected against that. Right? All right, so let's move on. Now they start to get a little bit more subtle. <clears throat> What's good and bad here? Why? OK, so the fact that our referrer is not SSL encrypted, I'm not real happy about that. Um, and, and we could redirect off to other things, I agree. Um, but, but there's another problem associated with that. <coughs> yeah, so it's the session cookie that I worry about. If the, the fact that this is coming into our application, it's got a session cookie right now, even though this context is SSL encrypted, it came from, or at least we're led to believe that it came from a non-encrypted context. That means that that session cookie is already, we have to treat it as compromised um, back on that authenticator page or wherever it's, the referrer is. 
we, we assume at this point that that session cookie was compromised on that referrer page. Everybody follow the logic there? Possible, yeah. Yep, so the, 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 the session cookie might be a secure only uh, attribute and it wouldn't have been sent on that page. So there's a couple of different scenarios here, but I still worry about that. Um, it, it, in my view, um, in, given this context and nothing more, I, I, I would be inclined to assume that session cookie has been compromised. Um, I want to throw that away and generate a new one, invalidate the session, create a new one. Um, and if I'm going to do that, um, a couple of things need to happen. What, what are the next steps programmatically that you, that you would want our authenticator here to be taking? I agree. So we're going to refresh that session cookie, we're going to generate a new one. Um, and we're going to check to see if these username and passwords um, are correct, right? Does it matter what order we do that in? Could be. So timing-wise, it, it matters. Um, here's the issue with this one. Um, and, and and again, these are years ago, and when I showed this and talked about this to the client, the client said, absolutely not, and, and prove it, and, and we did. We were able to come up with a test rig that was able to exploit this and break into their system. Here's what happens. Um, <clears throat> if we have the session token here, and it's been compromised, and we have to authenticate the user based on this username and password, um, and if we, if we authenticate first and then reset that cookie, there's a very brief moment in time, and it might just be a millisecond or so. There's a moment in time when the user is authenticated, and chances are that's going to be represented somewhere as a Boolean value, right? And, and if I remember correctly, this was even on some simple PHP crap at the back end. But uh, there's a moment in time when the user is authenticated, and the session cookie has still not been reset. If I have that, I can get, I can construct an HTTP post that sends in some other command with a valid cookie and a, an authenticated user. Everybody follow the logic to that? If you do it in the other order, we, throw, we reset the, the session cookie and then we authenticate the user, there's no moment in time when both of those states are true. So what we potentially have here is a race condition. You can't tell that exclusively from looking at this page but you can tell it through rigorous testing. When you see something like this, you come up with a scenario like that and say, there's a possible race condition here. Let's prove it. Um, and, and we did. Um, the last one here is less subtle than that, but I still have a question that's going to make you have to think a little bit. So this one, um, it's HTTPS, right? We're happy about that. There's no session cookie that we worry about here, right? It's basic, uh, straightforward stuff. What's the problem with this one? How many of you came to Jim's keynote on Monday morning. Yeah, it's a get with a username and a password. Why on earth would we be seeing this go through a network? What authenticator, what self-respecting authentication mechanism would ever do this? It's cached? All right, so there's a bunch of problems going on here, right? So um, the application itself probably didn't decide to do it this way, quite honestly. But in, in most Java environments, if I write a post servlet, there's a corresponding get unless I turn it off. So how could this scenario take place? I'll tell you what happened. It was a system administrator who had bookmarked a login page and put the parameters up on the URL line so that he could go into his, his system and start administering it straight off of a bookmark, but that bookmark was on his browser on a desktop machine that was locked in his office, and he felt that it was a safe practice. So now, what happens, to Jim's point on Monday, why is a get evil when a post would be acceptable for this exact same thing? Still SSL'd and everything. Yep, so um, almost every web server that I've ever seen in a production environment or otherwise 
logs every URL that's requested. Furthermore, you have, you have um, problems with that back in the browser land. Browsers keep a cache, of course. Uh, they shouldn't cache something that's SSL'd, but some browsers misbehave. And, and at the end of the day, we're, we're going to end up with that username and password stored in plain text in places where we don't want it to be, starting with that user's own bookmark file. Um, it's just not appropriate to store that in plain text. And the way we found this was by looking through a firewall log, and I saw this get going into a, um, a, a production server and said, wait a minute, we can't do that. And they said, well, don't worry about it, it's SSL encrypted. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, I know we just have a couple more minutes left. I want to talk about a couple things uh, just to kind of add on here that I think will be useful to, to consider. Um, I'm a huge fan of what John is talking about next door this morning and this afternoon, uh, and that is threat modeling. Um, most of the types of testing that I'm talking about, especially dynamic validation and risk-based testing in particular, most of those scenarios are going to be natural uh, outcomes of a good uh, threat modeling exercise. So when you're looking at the application that you're going <coughs> to test, uh, pay close attention to what you've done, hopefully already, in your threat model. Take those nightmare scenarios, turn them into test cases. That's a really good source of doing this. Uh, don't lose sight of tracking all your results. Um, I've seen so many times when a good, useful, meaningful discussion we whiteboard everything and we talk about all the issues about something. At the end of the meeting, we erase the whiteboard and walk out and nobody's tracked it and we, it all falls down and we forget about things. Um, tracking things, I know that that's pretty straightforward, but it's an easy mistake to make. A um, couple of real quick points on this one. You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, he's got the wrong slide in this deck. Um, but in the 1960s, there was a book published by this lady, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, called On Death and Dying, and in there she talks about the five stages of grief. How many of you guys are already familiar with five stages of grief? It should be a fairly well-known concept. When it comes to security testing, you will find all five of these stages of grief. Um, and, and our goal as tech technical folks is to try to shoot for acceptance, whether or not we're the customer um, having our own application tested, or if we're testing an application for somebody else. Um, acceptance is the good one, but I've seen all of these. Back when we did uh, testing for, uh, in the, the, the Department of Defense, um, uh, the, some of these guys up here, denial, anger, and stuff were enormous. Um, and, and so you, you learn to spot the warning signs. Um, the, 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 the denial one, well, you're, you're just testing on the test bed. It doesn't work that way in production. Um, anger, who the, who the bleep are you to tell me that I have a problem with my system? Um, bargaining, can't we just buy a web app firewall and put that in front of this application and not worry about input validation? Um, depression, um, oh my god, I knew it was bad, but I had no idea it was that bad. Um, all of those things happen. Um, and whether you're receiving the information or you're delivering that bad news, um, you need to look for those things and try to steer things in the right direction. Like, you know, that machine has, or that application has been in production for two years and nobody's ever exploited that problem. Well, I'm glad we caught it before somebody can exploit that problem, so let's fix it, you know. Put a positive spin on things, it really makes a difference. <clears throat> uh, my last point here before we break for uh, coffee. Um, I am a huge fan. Now, before I worked at the Department of Defense, I worked for eight years in academia. Um, I'll emphasize that I am not an academic, but, but I worked for eight years in academia. Um, and the, the, the knowledge sharing um, culture is hugely useful. When I've done penetration testing in everything from DOD environments to commercial environments, we always tried to make sure that the, the lessons learned aren't just the two or three engineers working on a, on a, a, a particular test, but the developers are learning from it. The, the rest of the test team is learning. We, at, the, at the DOD, we had test teams of a minimum of four people, two in, intern level folks and one or two senior engineers, um, and we used it as an apprenticeship model to learn how to do penetration testing. Uh, from a software development standpoint, when we find problems in our code, we can just quickly go in, like that printf back in our contact database, remember that? Um, we can just go in and fix that. It's a one-line code fix. 
But if we're not sharing that knowledge with the rest of the people that are developing our software, uh, we're making a huge mistake. And, and let's take that one step further um, to go back to more topical issues like SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, not only should we sh be sharing that information, but we should be publishing safe guidelines. So we found a problem in that last penetration test. We've decided to change all of our SQL calls to prepared statement or, or stored procedures. Here are the code patterns that we recommend everybody uses. Um, now we should be going through in, in our static code reviews doing compliance verification. We've published code guidelines. Now we make sure people are conforming to them. Um, that's taking knowledge sharing to the next level, but it really makes a difference. Um, I, I, don't, I, I think probably five times in different sessions this week I've heard people say, if you do nothing else, go back and fix all of your SQL calls to make them parameterized. Um, and and th th that sort of knowledge sharing is just absolutely golden. Um, that's why I come here to SecAppDev Dev every year. All right, so I'm going to stop here, but briefly, um, any questions? I know there's still quite a few more slides in this deck. Um, I, uh, my slides are available to you guys. I think they're on the website. If they're not, feel free to email me. I would be happy to share the slides with you. Uh, but if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. First, back here. Yeah, uh, fuzzing and dynamic validation and stuff like that, is it also done extensively in penetration testing? Or? So um, no is my answer to that. I don't see a lot of. Um, uh, well, some fuzzing absolutely happens during pen testing. So you can use fuzz testing if you're testing a single interface from the outside. So that can be relevant to pen testing. But dynamic validation, not so much. Um, so it, it, fuzz testing can be useful in an outside-in scenario like a pen test. Um, and I know a lot of pen testers will do that uh, specifically, but, but not va validation. Not usually. Um, the, the, the good news about that is a pen test, since it's from the outside trying to get in, uh, will sometimes find some pretty major issues where an attacker that, that would find out about this SQL injection, for example, could, could have stolen all of our um, credit card numbers out of the database. Um, that's the sort of thing that you'll find sometimes in a pen test. But the, 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 it's the, the stuff underneath the hood like not clearing out an encryption key, those are the things that really make me um, worry about an application more. So that's not to say that if our application spews all of its credit card numbers or our, our customer database out, that that's not a big problem, of course, but, but still. So, yes, Nellis. Mm -hmm. You can do it technically very well, but if you don't score well on the social part and getting people involved, you don't you're not going to affect change, right? So that's why I'm a huge fan of things like OWASP also. Um, and, and so I've, I've been participating in OWASP and other nonprofits in the security world for over 20 years. Um, and um, the, the model that we've adopted largely in the incident response operations world. And these are attacks on real production systems that people have dealt with over the years. Um, the model I like to encourage there is similar to in the medical profession. Um, it's acceptable to discuss a disease, um, the symptoms and the cures of the disease. It's not acceptable to talk about the patient. So when we're taking knowledge that we've learned in maybe a pen test or, or a threat uh, analysis, threat modeling, um, it, let's share that with the community. We won't talk about where I did this. I mean, I never named the, the site where we did the crypto analysis. I never talked about any of the names of the sites where you saw those HTTP posts and things like that. But those are huge lessons that we can all learn from. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's great to go to your monthly OWASP chapter meetings and do a, even a short lightning talk and say, we found this glaring problem in a test the other day I'd like to share with you guys. Um, I, I, I love seeing that sort of uh, information sharing. You know, there's a community I work with in the incident response world called FIRST, um, first.org out on the internet. They, it's a nonprofit, just like OWASP. Um, we hold about usually five or six times a year um, internal members-only uh, technical colloquia around the world. 
and the purpose, uh, I'd say probably 90% of the content in those um, colloquia are simply people getting together and talking about incidents that they've worked on. We leave the names at the door. We don't talk about names of customers that have been broken into, but we talk about attacks. People have shared first-hand experiences on things like Stuxnet, um, responding to incidents like that. Hugely important stuff in this world um, that we get together and talk about in those venues. It, it really is important. Grassroots. If what I like to do in, in there is do things like brown bag lunches, as we call them in the U.S. Uh, have like every other Friday, we'll order a couple boxes of pizza, some soda, and we're going to sit down in a conference room. And we're going to show you the the last pen test we worked on, or we're going to show you everybody on the team um, our source code review. Here are the, the, the six major findings from the last source code review that we did. And let's talk about the, the, the solutions we came up with, how we fixed the problems. Um, and and it, all it takes is one or two engineers that's willing to spend some time and talk about those things to be able to share in a meaningful way. It can be very grassroots fr from the bottom levels up, uh, but those things have long-term impacts. And uh, when I was at the Department of Defense, when we were starting to do our penetration testing, there were no commercial tools for doing that. So we were writing our own stuff. We used to set up um, um, a lab. We had a couple of spare uh, computers, Windows. Uh, back then, it was Sun workstations. We set up a lab that, you know, we're engineers. We called it the Attacker Defender Lab. Just a couple of machines on an Ethernet, um, but in two separate rooms. One room was where we were training our, uh, our penetration testers. And in the other room, I was training all my team to be able to do effective system administration work. Right, so your job over on the defender side is here's a Sun workstation, it's yours. You have to go in and, and set it up. You have to install all the patches. And there, weren't, there wasn't Windows update. It was you go out to Sun's FTP site and download the patches sort of thing. But you have to set that up and make it so that the testers next door aren't going to break into your system. And then at the end of that, we'd go through like a two-week cycle. At the end of that, we all got together and did a post-mortem of, oh, yeah, we broke in, and you guys didn't even know it, and, and here's what we did at this side. And that sharing of information, it cost us pretty much nothing except time and, and energy, um, but it, it, it was hugely effective. That's how we honed our penetration testing team. Any other questions, comments? Well, thanks for coming. I hope you found it worthwhile. I appreciate you guys hearing what I had to say. Thanks.